Hi, everyone. My team members decided to, to leave me on the stage by myself, so thank you. <laughs> and thanks, Mr. Keith, for, for, the, for the award. And Yolanda, I wish like when I get older, I will get that reception that you got. This was the most amazing thing that, 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 that just happened. So thank you, everyone. Uh, so we're just going to dig deeper a little bit uh, uh, into new view, and, and hopefully we can justify why we got this award today. So let's see. Uh, so yesterday, we heard a lot of people talk about uh, creative thinking and innovation and kind of presented a perfect case for, for why a place like Nuvo uh, kind of needed to exist. But I'm going to go a little bit on the, on the nerdy side and going to go back to my dissertation that I did in the architecture school at MIT. And I'm going to talk about triangles. So bear with me for a bit. So imagine that you have this rule that says every time you see a triangle, rotate that triangle 180 degrees around its center. And the task you're going to have is basically take that shape that you have on the left and apply the rule uh, basically on a triangle each time and get to the shape that you have on the right. And the thing that you cannot do is that you cannot really rotate the whole shape around its, uh, its center. So you cannot do this. This is not allowed because that's cheating. The idea of the rule is to basically rotate the triangle exactly around the, its center. So let's just start doing this one by one. So we're going to take the left triangle, and we're going to rotate it. And then we're going to take the right one, and then the bottom one. And obviously, we did not get to the right shape. So we're going to keep rotating. And here's the sad part. We are back to how we started. So it did not work. So we're going to keep going, and hopefully something is going to happen. So we rotate again. And, and this is basically the shift that needed to happen to make this, this uh, successful. So if you started looking at this shape, we actually have now five triangles as opposed to three. We have the three original ones, but then we have the red one and the blue one. And this is the magic part. This is what seeing allows us to see when we shift our, our kind of framework. And now we can apply the rule to the big one. And now we do it to the second one. And we keep going. And now we apply it to the smaller triangles. And we get to the right shape. Uh, so this is something that is called shape grammars, and, and this is when I was doing my PhD, I was working with my advisor, uh, George Steine, on this. And, and this basically provides a framework to explain what creative thinking is. And if you looked at this uh, kind of process, uh, you need a combination of, of rules. You need to know how to apply the rules, and then the other thing that is really uh, missing in, in a lot of kind of discussions around creative thinking is this whole notion of seeing this ability for humans to kind of recognize emergent shapes and, and, and uh, uh, apply the rules on them. And just to give you an idea how this kind of relates to, to some of the projects that we have, uh, we're going to talk about falafel. Usually when I talk to American audience, a lot of them don't know what falafel is. So hopefully a lot of you would know what that is. So I am, I am Syrian, and when I came to, to MIT and Cambridge, uh, the thing that was missing is falafel, which is the national food that we have. <laughs> so I thought something really you know, good would be to kind of use the school that I started to reimagine what the falafel experience would look like. So we gave the students the task of redesigning that falafel experience. And they came up with this idea of a, of a falafel donut. So rather than having this a small piece, you can actually turn the, 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 the whole shape into a donut. So, and then later on, the idea was to design uh, a card that will go with it. So these are some of the molds that, that uh, my students were designing. And we did not have a kitchen. So they will print, 3D print these molds, and they will give them to me at home. And I will basically make the falafel and test them. And this is after the 10th time. We have a perfect sandwich with, with some structural kind of integrity to it in the middle, as you can see. Uh, so the second question became about designing the cart. And this is very typical of the work that we do. We ask the students to produce endless amounts of iterations, uh, partly because we want to expand kind of the way they see it. They see kind of the universe of solutions that we have. Uh, and there are all sorts of different uh, 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 kind of options here. The one that obviously attracted our attention was the one that looks like a donut, uh, which you see the, the two circles. Uh, and it had two wheels at the bottom. 
uh, it happened that we were having guest critics kind of moving around, and then when he saw that one, he imagined the whole thing being a wheel. He did not actually see the, the small wheels, and all of us sitting around the table, including the student, had this aha moment, it's like how come we did not see that? So the question basically for the rest of the studio became how to, to actually turn this whole cart into a whole wheel and remove the two wheels inside. And so basically the whole shift happened from here to here. And that had a kind of dramatic kind of impact on the, on the project. So, and this is us on the street. We used to kind of do this every month where we will, I will make these uh, donut falafels and go outside and feed all the students that we have. So when it comes to creative learning, this whole kind of two things are really key. Having the rules on one side and having the seeing on one part. Rules for us, in some ways, it's not just triangles kind of moving around. It really represents a lot of kind of the, the, the human knowledge that we have in terms of textbooks and the rules that govern the world. Seeing is this kind of human ability to recognize uh, emergent shapes or insights that we did not see before. And we need both of these things uh, to, to be able to have creative learning. And if we looked at the whole history of our educational system, uh, I think at least the, the, the kind of the last 150 years of it, a lot of it was predicated on the rules only. So how we can take all these rules, put them in textbooks, and the role of the teacher becomes kind of the, the transfer of these rules. And the, the piece that is always missing is the, is the seeing piece. And this is also evident when the students come to us from regular schools and we ask them to solve a, 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 a project. Uh, the last thing that they want is actually for us to kind of change their view in the world. The thing that they only ask for is, is how to make it happen. They just want the rules because they are so conditioned basically just to kind of learning the rules and not, not kind of explore the, the, the other universe of solutions that they have. Uh, so how do we start kind of nurturing this, this notion of, of seeing with the kids? Uh, so this is where my background as an architect becomes really handy. I did actually my PhD in the architecture school. Uh, so I started looking into the architecture studio as a model for, nurture, uh, for nurturing seeing. And this is kind of a very typical picture of how a studio would look like. I think the, 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 the goal that we've had for the last kind of eight years since we started is how to take this model and then apply it to high school setting. So this is actually the studio that we have in Cambridge. And these are some of the students working in it. And we're gonna just gonna, I'm gonna just go through the process a little bit and show you how, how, how this kind of notion of seeing kind of translate into, into a creative process. Uh, so we like always to talk about it in terms of express route and scenic route. Uh, so the express route is, is a straight shot. The scenic route is a little bit more complicated. Uh, the studio always starts with a studio brief. Uh, so we are always framing a challenge for the students to work on. It's not like we just throw the students in the space and tell them to do anything that they want. We always need to have a framework uh, that the students work on. Uh, and we, we always try to bring really interesting problems into the table that the students have not really kind of dealt with before. Uh, so this is the express route. You know, this is kind of when the students come to us first. This is what they want to do. They just want to put their goggles and go you know, 400 miles at an hour. It's, it's like the homework uh, mindset. It's like the faster you do it, the better. And for us, we want to slow this down so they can go through a creative process. And these cartoons are actually very new. This is kind of, we started doing them a few months ago because we thought it's a lot easier for the kids to understand what we are trying to say. And it's, it's been kind of effective. Uh, so we want them to take the scenic route and enjoy the journey. Uh, so the thing that we do is, 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 is do what we call in, in our, as an architecture team, we do precedence work. So if the uh, issues that we are dealing with relates to kind of a museum, we go to the museum. It's dealing with kind of solving a problem for a, a disabled person. We go and interview that person. We invite them to the, to the, to the school. So we do a lot of work that, that basically creates a vivid context for the students to work in. Uh, the, our brainstorming session is, is designed so the students go, don't get stuck with their initial ideas. We always talk about these in terms of seeds of ideas. Uh, the idea that, you know, as you come up with the seed, it's going to change over time. So don't just get fixated on this. And we try to also have all the ideas on the board and then the students basically copy and paste from each other and take that seed that they have. And, and the goal after that is basically to take that seed and grow it to be the full project. 
Uh, and so here's a scenario of what happens. Uh, so the students kind of uh, produce something in response to the, to the problem that we are giving them. Uh, the instructor, or the coaches as we call them, they try to kind of dig deeper into the idea to understand what the idea is. And they understand how they got here and the design decisions that they made to get there. And this is kind of the key moment that goes back to seeing is like they always give them other ways to see this problem. So rather than seeing this problem as a three triangles, can you see it as five? Because that is the moment when a lot of the magic is going to happen. And this is the response of the students always. <laughs> You know, this goes back to when we were probably three years old and making uh, drawings and our parents thinking that we are like Picassos and putting them on the fridge and nobody is giving us actually feedback on, on these. <laughs> so, so, you know, this, the, the, we try very hard not to make the kids really cry, so we are very thoughtful about that piece. Uh, but there is, you know, there's always this is like, why are you kind of attacking my ideas. It's, for them, their ideas are always part of who they are, and what we are trying to do is basically to externalize their ideas and allow them to put them on the table outside so everybody can have a conversation around that. Uh, so, and this is, we are happily kind of telling the kids, we just, just believe us and we want to expand your universe. And obviously this happens a million times over the, the process, so this is not just one time instance. Uh, you know, uh, for the kids who are with us for three months or to a year or four years, this is kind of happens daily like almost 10 times. And this is our kind of ideal scenario. When I showed this to the coaches, everybody started laughing. It's like, oh, this never happens. <laughs> you know, but this is kind of our ideal scenario is that the kids are able to kind of see these possibilities as more as an advantage and, and they can understand what we are trying to do is, is to kind of just expand the way they think about the problem so they can take that and synthesize it, synthesize it with their own ideas and make something really interesting after that. Uh, collaboration for us is really key. And even as adults, I think these are the problems that we face all the time. We always think that the people that we work with, they are trying to crush our ideas or our ideas are the best and all of that. So with young kids, this is actually even more intense. So what we try to do is also we go back to this whole notion of seeing is that you know what we try to encourage is that the more ways of seeing you have the, the better uh, the better the team that's going to be in the long run uh, our presentation also is really documenting these kind of shifts in way of seeing uh, so this is it's very kind of consistent with with how we with how we teach the whole process uh, we do kind of a lot of documentation uh, so the students are taking pictures and basically every day they are talking about the design decisions that they are making and these shifts uh, of seeing that, that, are, that are happening. And we ended up building a whole platform for that because we could not really find anything that would do the job that we wanted. So, so we've built this whole system that would allow our students to do this on a daily basis. So our process uh, takes somewhere between two to three weeks. Uh, each studio and the students are working on the problem for basically six hours every day from nine to three. And our whole kind of curriculum is based on that. It's divided into sessions and every session is composed of studios and students are placed in these studios. So we don't have courses whatsoever. It's all kind of studio, studio experiences that we have. So these are some of the projects that our students uh, have worked on over the years. Uh, this has been, has been a very kind of special collaboration with, with Heidi Lasky, who's a, a choreographer here in New York, and she mainly works with disabled dancers. And the amazing part about the work is that she really wants to uh, kind of really change the way we look at disability. So rather than you know, seeing a disabled person and, 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 and kind of looking away, she wants to kind of the viewer to be engaged in, in this interesting conversation with, with what they are seeing in front of them. Uh, so we, at some point, started this collaboration with them to design wearables that would magnify the expression that the dancers have and, and kind of look at the disability that they have in a different light. So this is one of the dancers that we started working on. She's, she's, her left leg is amputated. Uh, these are kind of some of the sketches uh, that the students came up with. These are some of car the cardboard models, and this is very typical of the process that we have. We start always with sketches, just to kind of put the ideas on the table, and then you know the second phase would be to kind of move into cardboard uh, and like more refined sketches. 
And these are like some more kind of refined ideas. This is when they landed on this idea of, of the kind of mermaid and the fishing scales because the, she, the, the woman wrote a song about that and, and the, the kids gravitated around this idea. Uh, so they wanted to do something that looks like a mermaid with fish scales on it. And this is uh, a more refined prototype. And more prototypes. And this is the final piece. And this is a quick video that shows you the process with the, uh, of the project. So we actually ended up working with almost 20 of, their, of her dancers on, on designing diff, different, uh, different wearables. And, and this kind of spanned over, over six studios. Uh, a big part of the work that we do, almost I would say 50% of the studios that we have, center this, that around this whole notion of, of uh, disability. Uh, and we kind of landed on this, I would say, four years ago. Uh, for us, as a, as, a, as a school, we are always trying to find this creative niche where we feel like our students can, can, can really have an impact. Uh, so we cannot cure cancer. We don't have labs and all of that. But what, what other areas can, can we carve out for our students to be kind of creative and, and have an impact? And a lot of it started with this kid who happened to have the same name as me, Saeed. He was adopted from Afghanistan a few years ago, and he used to go to a public school, but he never really liked to be in a classroom. So he ended up coming to us for a year. And I remember him the second day he, he was at the school, he came to my office, and the first thing he told me is, like, I want to design a flying wheelchair. And I was like, ah, oh, maybe this is, I don't know if we can do that. <laughs> but, you know, why don't you propose kind of 20 different problems that we can solve and, and bring them back to me? And then he actually went and brought a lot more than that. And, and for someone who never really had, knew someone who, who, who uh, uses a wheelchair, I did not realize kind of the, 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 all the problems that are happening in a wheelchair. The most basic one, for instance, he just wanted uh, a bucket where he can, or a bag where he can put stuff that is not in the back. Usually all of the bags happen to be in the back of your bag. So you cannot really move your, your hand and, and pick up whatever you want it. Uh, so he ended up designing for himself this universal arm, and he's also a filmmaker, so he wanted something to hold his camera, like a tripod, and he wanted to have his drinks and be able to hold his laptop and all of that. So he did some, some really amazing work with this, and he called it the universal arm. Another project that came out of this is called the hand drive, and this is a quick video also just to show you the process. Yeah. 
please, I'm trying to read it again. Oh my god, I can't believe we're going to do this again. I am an artist, and it's a good thing. I see and feel the world very deeply. But I also see the elderly person on the street struggling with the zipper of their jacket, and my mind starts thinking of inventions that could help them. The great thing about Vivian is I have like both the art piece here and like the mechanical and technical piece here. As like the art piece grows, then it's like, oh, the technical piece has to grow. And then like as the technical piece grows and the art piece grows, and, like things just get keep getting like bigger and better. So what are we got here? So this is a handbag wheelchair attachment, which can attach, attach to any wheelchair and it allows it to be powered in a remote motion. That one is super cool just because it took off. It really became a thing. And it's like, I know that it's something useful for the world and like people are actually like trying to use it, which I think is super cool. I think that the Fashion Week studios have changed my life in a lot of ways. That's one of the instances where it really goes from zero to 100 so quickly. And like 100 is like a real fashion show with like real photographers, real models, real everything. I always realized I had that spark and that excitement to learn. But before, I wasn't given the chance to let this grow. After pushing myself through project after project, I see the world through a different lens and see the impact I can make. I'm actually not that mean. I just don't, I don't just tell the kids, oh, this sucks, you know. I think I usually provide an explanation for that. <laughs> so this feels a little bit kind of misrepresenting how I do stuff. <laughs> uh, so we do a lot of work around kind of, I, I would say, neighborhood activism. We are always kind of, we have our readers kind of out and we're trying to see are there any issues around that, that we can uh, have our kids kind of uh, have, a, have a contribution to. And at one point we decided to build this uh, big uh, mural on, on the side of the wall. And uh, what we asked the students is to go out to the neighborhood and uh, ask what people really wanted to, to kind of see in that, in that mural. And the word that always uh, came back from, from those discussions is this whole notion of belonging and, and being part of a neighborhood. Uh, so they ended up building this whole kind of mural, which is amazing in itself. But what, what's really amazing is what happened after that. It's like a few weeks after that, there was a, a Black Lives Matter kind of gathering and they decided to gather in front of the mural. And basically they had these post-it notes and they gave everybody a post-it note to write how they feel about it. And they, you know, they put the post-it notes on the mural itself. And for our kids to see kind of, you know, even in a smaller scale around your neighborhood, you are doing just a mural and thinking maybe this is not gonna have an impact. You can see how the story continues afterward. Uh, for us, the children books have been also another kind of amazing uh, medium to, to explore kind of deeper and social issues. Uh, this is kind of a storybook that some of the students kind of made and, and, and wrote about uh, uh, this whole notion of refugee integration. So you have the red bear and the blue bear. The bl blue bear is the one that comes from the outside and how uh, this whole thing kind of causes a lot of uh, uh, you know, anxiety in, in the community and, and uh, we were just kind of reviewing this story before the presentation and, and unfortunately the story does not have a happy ending at the end and I was like, this is a children's book, it should have a happy ending at the end. But it does not, but you know, for, for kids, this is kind of a way for them to express uh, kind of complex issues and, and kind of symbol kind of graphics and stories for, for, for people to understand. Uh, we also do a lot of game designs, but also a lot of our games kind of reflect something uh, that, that is more happening in the world, maybe on a, on a global scale. Uh, this is uh, kind of a game that talks about the, the Catalan independence movement and how this using the tractor as a symbol to kind of block police cars. The amazing part about that was published in one of the, in Venture Beat, and then we, we got a lot of people liking it also, but we got a lot of people not liking it. So it, it kind of created this really interesting kind of conversation ar around that, and the students got really excited about that. Uh, the notion of assessment uh, has been a really kind of 
tricky issue to kind of engage with. For us, initially, we did not want to do any of it because we thought, you know, the students get whatever they want to get out of it. Our goal is to create these amazing experiences with them, and, you know, each kid will take whatever they want to take out of it. But we soon realized that we need to be able to communicate what the students are doing to the world, and this is basically our responsibility. So what we talked about before about documentation, we actually do, even from the coach's side, we do uh, like very kind of detailed tracking of the, of the students and their skill sets that they are learning. Uh, so this is all integrated in the platform, and at, at the end of every studio experience, we track the design skills and the subject skills, and we have also written reports about them. And now what, they are, what we are able to do is to actually generate transcripts that we can, we can uh, communicate to college. So the students that you saw Kate who spent four years with us, she's actually doing her dual degree now between RISD and Brown. So she does the design at RISD and the engineering at Brown. And she completely had an alternative transcript like this with, with no grades in it at all. Uh, so probably a lot of you he heard these terms, you know, this is something that, you know, from, from the schools that come and visit and the schools that we go and visit, this, these are the trends. And when we started, uh, you know, eight years ago, uh, the thing that we always heard about um, from schools is that 21st century skills. And, you know, for us coming from a different environment, we, we always thought that was like the weirdest thing ever to call skills by the century number. You know, I don't know why that, that was a smart idea at the time. So thankfully that changed into STEAM and people started calling design thinking and now they call it maker spaces. And the theory that I have about why these things keep changing every two years is that none of them really get, get stuck within schools. I think a lot of them kind of get in and get deflected and leave because it's hard for schools to kind of build a culture uh, around this. It's always, you know, how kids going to get to college, what's going on, and all of that, and the transcript, and we need to have grades and stuff. So a lot of these things kind of come in and go out as fast as they could. Uh, so what we decided to do, I would say, a year and a half ago is to create this network uh, of schools that are kind of kind of together with us working on, on uh, energizing these schools and, and changing the culture of the school from, from within. Uh, so a big part of it is, is sharing a lot of the kind of pedagogy that we have, sharing a lot of the studio experiences that we have, uh, and uh, as you can see, these are some of the spaces that other schools have built, and we also have our what we call Nova Fellows embedded in the schools, and a big part of that is basically to have this direct connection with the school and allow these people to kind of uh, really work in the school from within. And we work uh, closely with a lot of the teachers, uh, and in some of the schools, for instance, that we work with, uh, some, school, some teachers stopped actually teaching their regular subjects and they completely shifted to teaching studio experiences, which is kind of amazing to see. Uh, and we, these are the eight schools that, that, that are part of the network uh, currently. The amazing part about it is that we have something all the way in India and, and Turkey and all the way in, in Kansas. Uh, so it's been kind of exciting to see this network grow over the last uh, year and a half. Uh, the, the, some of the, the things that are happening now that are coming out of the, the, the impact of having a network is this whole notion of cross-continent collaboration. Uh, so the school that we have in Turkey is actually on the border uh, with, with, with Syria. So a lot of the people who are in the school are Syrian refugees. And there are a lot of clinics around there that deal with the, with the kids with, with disability. Uh, so what we decided to do is to teach a studio between the school in Florida and the school in, in uh, uh, in Turkey, and so we have uh, each team has two members and two kids in Turkey, and then two students in All Saints, and they are working on five cases. And the kids actually who are in Turkey, they decided to go out into the community and document five cases that we could work on. Uh, so, so that alone in itself, you know, was really kind of empowering for our kids here in the U.S. to see, but also for the kids there to feel like they can actually solve. Uh, some of the problems that they have outside. So this has actually been, been amazing just to kind of see all of this is done over Skype. There's a language barrier. There are a lot of barriers, but it's been kind of really amazing to see kind of the impact of that network. Uh, we are doing a lot of kind of what we call pedagogical experiments. So this is happening actually in a public school in, a, in, in Woodstock, and they mostly, you know, wanted to kind of reinvent how a lot of the subjects are taught. Uh, so this is, for instance, in the physics uh, course, how to take a lot of the ideas that they have and put it in a, in a format of studio experiences. So this is the dream that we have since we are allowed to dream here at the end. I, 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 we, we really would like to kind of build this to a much larger network that, that puts a student's creativity at, at its core. 
Thank you, everyone.